months ago, Glenn Dunbar came up to me, and I think a number of you know Glenn. John, I want you, you have a lot of roots in the Redland Valley. I want you to do a presentation. So I thought about it, and I thought, oh, how exciting this will be. Well, maybe for my two sisters that are in the audience, but for everybody else, I thought, God, this company is kind of boring. So what I've tried to do is mix in a lot of pictures, a lot of people, places, and I've put in a bunch of stories. Most of them are true stories. Um, and I'd like to really thank I have Art Williams over here on keyboards. Um, <laughs> this together and help things. So we will move to the first slide. Um, so my name again is John Miller. I retired in 2021 after 18 years in corporate financial roles and then another 20 years in the Medicaid program in Pennsylvania. Uh, I lived in the Redland Valley, Harry Township, uh, part-time for my first 22 years and Later on, uh, I moved here full time and I've been here 22 years full time. So the picture. So the picture shows uh, my pastime of cycling, which a lot of the cycling I do is in the Redland Valley. A lot of great roads, a lot of great history and farmland here. So uh, that, uh, that's my partner, Darlene. We do like to do a lot of riding. Agenda. Okay, I'm going to talk about my families that have migrated to the Redland Valley. Uh, there's 15 of them. Um, I'll talk a little about when they came here, where they came from. Uh, then we'll look at the nationalities of these, of these families. And then I'm going to talk about four of the families. I'm not going to talk about all 15. I would lose you if I talked about all 15. So, next slide. Okay, so this is the slide showing uh, my ancestors that came to the Redland Valley and where they came from and when they came from. Uh, on this chart, you can see a few of them came directly from Germany. Others came from other parts of Pennsylvania, mostly around Philadelphia and southern York County before they came. Um, to this area. Um, you can see some of the names, Hart, uh, Vernon, Evans, Landis, Moore, Peterman, two different few families, Cloud, Fillmore, and Malone came during the second half of the 18th century and then in the first half of the 19th century, Strominger, Truth, and Troyer. Now when I first got here to do this presentation, uh, a woman came up to me and said, oh, I'm interested in Miller being my name. Um, and when you look at this slide here, you won't see any Millers here because uh, no Millers in my lines lived in the Redland Valley as full-time residents until myself and my family moved here in 2001. So I hope uh, she enjoys um, the discussion anyways. <laughs> Okay, next page. So these are the nationalities of the people that we saw on the other page. Um, you can see a lot of them from Germany. Uh, I do have some of the dates. Uh, the Hart, Strominger, Peterman, and Troop from Germany all came all about the same time around 1750. Um, some directly from Germany, others to other areas of the state before they came. Uh, then the English people, the Vernon and Cloud, uh, they came, um, they left Europe in the six, 1682, both of those families. Um, Welsh um, Pews came in 1687. Uh, so I realized that um, all the people that settled in my background for the Red, uh, Redland Valley uh, all through my father's mother's side of the family. So this background is only a quarter of my entire background. Uh, I have a lot of other uh, nationalities in my background. 
Okay, uh, this is the first family that we're going to talk about, and this is kind of the landscape of how uh, my four great 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 grandfather Michael Strumminger uh, was the first one that came into the Red Land Valley, and that was in 1802. And we will talk about his son, grandson, and further down the line, something of the lines. Um, before we get into the Strominger, I wanted to talk about the cemetery, which is up <coughs> in the Reavers, and Silver Lake Inn. Uh, I, I have a number of different ancestors buried there. It's the old Union Lutheran Reformed <coughs> Church burial ground, known as Bat's Nest. Um, so a number of my ancestors, <coughs> uh, besides being called Bat's Nest, it's also called the Battler's Cemetery. So you may see that in different places. Uh, the graves that are in there, most, uh, probably 90% of them aren't readable or are broken off, uh, are from the 1800s to the 1850s. The church has existed uh, in 1792 and it was torn down in 1873. Uh, before it was torn down, there were bats living in it in the belfry. And that's where the name of the cemetery became Bat's Nest. Um, the church that was torn down in 1873 uh, was at the very far end of the property. Uh, there's a little bit of a foundation that very edgy, you can, you can still see. Uh, so it's been a subject of three Eagle projects over the years, uh, one by myself in 1978. Uh, there was enough, somebody else did it after that, and then my son did it again in 2017. Um, and he put uh, put steps in and to work with it was uh, swampy down below and cut trees and cleaned it out and put in a nice sign. Uh, the nice sign has his name on it um, and since his name's on there, I kind of felt obligated to kind of look after it so that <laughs> his name is good standing. <laughs> okay, so we're starting at the top of the list with Michael Strumming first immigrant into the Redland Valley. Uh, he was my great, 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 great grandfather. He came over in 1802 from Pelham Township. Um, his father, Jakob, uh, came from Germany. Uh, he arrived on a ship named the Barkley that came out of Rotterdam in 1754 when he was 26. Uh, Michael's house in the Redland Valley uh, was over by Sinsburg Road and, and Silver Lake Road. Uh, it's since been, uh, since been torn down. Uh, Michael fought in the Revolutionary War, and you can see in the picture here, there is a bronze marker, and there is also a, a plaque um, telling about Michael Strumming. Um, and then also in this picture, you see this so weird silver thing. Uh, what that is, is a pressure cooker. And this is a detail of it. My father would get pressure cookers and engrave them, hand engrave them, and put them in various places. So this one uh, says Michael Strominger, born about 1764, died about 1841. He served as a captain in Michael Kleinfeld's company, Windsor Township. Um, and then he actually has all the uh, references back to uh, different uh, reference materials where he obtained his information. Um, you'll see another one later in the presentation. And there's also two of these in my garage currently that he put instructions for someone to take and bury them at the Redlands uh, Meeting House Cemetery. Now, I don't know if I want to go into the cemetery with a shovel and get that to cement and bury one of these things. So, I, I haven't gotten around to that. I'm going to get to see Mark will do it. 
<laughs> so that's Michael. Um, and then lastly, Michael's third son, Jacob. Uh, he lived in a house built in 1835. It's at the corner of Old Quaker Road and Hot Hill Road. As you can see it. It's, this is a current picture that I just took of it. Um, you also notice when you go by, it says, slow the truck down. Uh, going past it, so. It is on a very kind of dangerous, uh, dangerous little in intersection. Okay, moving down the list, we're going to move to John Strominger, who married Rachel Kilmore. Uh, he was the brother of, of the house that I just showed you on the prior slide. So, John Strominger, great 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 grandfather, he was born in this area in 1807. And he was the 11th child of Michael Strominger that we just talked about. And Michael actually had two sons named John. The first one died, and then he was one of the earlier ones, and then they reused son's name, so the 11th and last child of Michael Strominger was John Strominger, uh, who married Rachel Kilmore and built a house on Sinsburg Road next to his father's house in 1854. And this is <coughs> off of Sinsburg Road and Silver Lake Drive. Uh, actually, the, if you continue down Sykes Road and across Sinsburg, you come right to this to this house. His house is there standing, and his father's was next to it somewhere in the area. Uh, locals here may know the stoners. They, they've owned this house for a number of years. Okay, moving down, we're getting to my great-great-grandfather, David Henry Strominger. We're gonna talk about him. His wife was Elizabeth Vernon Park. He had eight children, and we're going to be talking about those uh, in subsequent slides. So. Okay, David Henry Strominger, um, great great grandfather. He was born in 1833 in the Fairview Township. He was the ninth child of John Strominger. Uh, he married Elizabeth Vernon Hart, who was born in 1838. Uh, that's a picture of Elizabeth Vernon Hart. That big picture hung above the mantle in our parlor, and she used to scare the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Very scary. Maybe my sister's too. Uh, she didn't scare you? No. Okay. <laughs> um, we found out that David Henry uh, was a superintendent at Lewis Ferry United Methodist Church <clears throat> when they did the time capsule uh, reveal uh, back in uh, like 2000 something. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was interesting to know. Mm -hmm. uh, then here, this is the house that was on the property when David Henry uh, purchased, purchased it back in 1849. And this little house, which been added on a couple times, uh, there were eight <coughs> children living in this house. Now there's two adults and one, two, two cats, one cat. Yeah, two cats right two, now. Two cats. two cats are right now living in it. So. <laughs> okay. So, hard life in the old house. Um, in 1877, uh, diphtheria plague uh, took four of the children from David and Elizabeth. Uh, Clyde and his Marker as Clyde, uh, first on January 2nd, and he was age four. Joey, on uh, four days later, at age seven, he was seven. Davy, two days after that, uh, eight, he was nine. And then Jacob, uh, three weeks after that, at age 11. And you can see this is Clyde's, Clyde's, which is a smaller one. These are Joseph. Joey and David, they're a little bit bigger, and then Jacob has a bigger one. Um, i just just thinking about how terrible it would be to be the parents and, and just watching one by one their children dying, and, and also the there, there were three siblings at the time too, 
that would have been teenagers watching their younger siblings passing away. Uh, my ancestor, that was Elmer, was 13 at the time, but he managed to either not get diphtheria or survived it. Um, this is up on Heck Hill Road at St. John's Cemetery. It's mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. New house. In 1884, this was seven, seven years after leaving <coughs> Adam's family, um, and, and three of his four children were, uh, were grown up, uh, David built a new house. Uh, the first thing they did is they moved the old house, the white house, from the prior uh, slide, was actually put on the logs and moved over behind and over here. Um, I don't know why they did that with all the, 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 all the land they had. Um, the new house had central heating, which was just the newest thing at the time, and because it had central heating, they didn't put any fireplaces in the house. So a lot of people ask, why aren't there fireplaces? And that was the reason. Um, some of the other features, uh, there was a dumbwaiter in the kitchen that actually went down into the well area, and my grandmother used to ride on the dumbwaiter. Uh, it had symmetrical balconies, we'll see those in some other pictures. It has 72 shutters, we'll talk about that. Uh, and one interesting thing about it, the plans that were used for this house came from a building in Mechanicsburg that was not made of stone. And they didn't take into account the size of the stone. And what happened is the closets got shorted. The closets are only about this deep because they didn't take into account the size of the stone. Uh, also, the new central, great new central heating didn't really work because there were no electric fans to push the heat up. They thought, oh, we'll just rise up <coughs> through the vents, um, but it didn't happen. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Okay, next page. Uh, so this is a, uh, a side, one of the side views. Uh, up there is the, the stone showing that it was built by David Henry Strominger in 1884. Um, you can see one of the balconies on the west side. And I'll point out um, right there, there's a missing shutter. Um, so of the 72 shutters on the house, 62, 60, 66 are still original shutters. And I spent a lot of time ever, each winter pulling some down and reworking them. Some of them are just a little sanding and put some paint on other ones just fall apart. And major rebuilding for that. Um, but one of the reasons, when, if you look at houses of this age, um, anywhere, you rarely see any shutters on them because they've deteriorated. The reason these shutters have survived is for about 50 years, they were, had been pulled off the house and were stored inside. So they've gotten an extra 50 years of life coming. Uh, this is the downstairs hallway. Um, this is unique. The, this desk and that chair are the only two surviving uh, pieces of furniture from the, house, from the original house. I think that's my cat there. <laughs> um, and some of the pictures that you saw in other slides are there and there. Uh, David Henry uh, and Elizabeth Vernon Hart. Page. Uh, this is the part of the formal parlor. Uh, the furnishings in here are not original, uh, but they all are other than the rug and uh, coffee table. These are all furnishings that are over 100 years old. Uh, when we first moved back into the house in 2001, those uh, pieces of furniture were in there. And good old solid furniture, we decided to uh, reupholster them rather than buy new cheap furniture. 
that are all over 100 years old. Another thing to notice uh, is the deep window wells being uh, at the uh, stone house. Uh, acts, acts really lovely. They especially like the ones that you have cluttered up with stuff on it, and they like to get on those and like kick the coffee off into other things that just recently happened. Uh, so here is the mantle, which, wow, there's no fireplace. It's a heating vent, which just seems odd, but that's, that's the way it was. I didn't want a fireplace. That was, that was old technology. Um, so the David and Henry that built the house that we've talked about that lost four children, their youngest child, uh, who was born after the diphtheria plague, was an artist. Um, these are some of her paintings that are in the house. And she also painted glassware and made uh, vase. Uh, there's quite a number of paintings that we have, um, different siblings and I have, and different pieces. Uh, next, I just threw this slide in, a picture of my mom, it's kind of out of sequence, it's my mom and dad in 1979, this is the view from the other side of the house, and again there's the uh, balcony, and you can see some of the French doors that are on that side, there, 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 and there are all French doors. Uh, this was a picture taken and in the paper for a, a um, house tour back in 1970. Uh, there was a barn. Uh, there's a the barn. You can see a picture of it in this picture. Uh, and the rumor was that the Sittensburg Road has the big curve that's outside the house uh, because there was some agreement not to tear the barn down. So the road uh, makes this big turn to go around the barn and continue on. Otherwise, it would have been a pretty uh, straight shot. Uh, so in January 1938, the barn was burned down by arson. Uh, what had happened is a local boy, a six-year-old, was mad at the little boy that had lived in the White House that we saw earlier in the slide. Uh, and at that point in history, that house was being rented. So this little six-year-old boy thought he'd get even to the, for this kid by burning his barn down. Well, it wasn't his, he was just, he was, his parents just rented. Um, so he would have a nice den. It was a, a pretty significant barn. Okay, next, uh, we're gonna talk about John Strum here. He was the third child of he was the second child of David and Henry Strominger, and a great, great uncle of mine. Um, he was David's son. He was born in 1862. Uh, he died in 1887. He was a school teacher and died of pneumonia. Um, his coat was stolen. He went to a, 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 a school meeting in the winter. It was snowing horse and buggy. Someone stole his coat. He had to ride home without a coat. He subsequently uh, caught pneumonia and died. And was, I'll read the article that was in uh, the York Daily newspaper on Wednesday, March 12, 1884. J.C. Strominger was born January 14, 1859 and died 4, March 4, 1884, aged 24. Years, one month, and 19 days. Calm and peaceful looking, so very much as if he had lain down to a quiet hour of sleep. Impressive indeed was the whole scene, from the beautiful floral offerings of loving hearts to the silent scores whose expressive faces, as they passed by the sleeping one, told of the loss felt by so many upon whose esteem and affection John's life and person had taken deep hold. Heart-touching was it all, from the little sister 
of all but six years, scarce conscious of her loss, to the father with silent tears, the dear sister Lily and the younger brother yielding as the bending tree to the pangs of grief and the loving mother's plaint plaintive cry, oh John, as we looked at the classmates weeping at the open casket, as we saw a sobbing group of young girls whose loved teacher lay so silent before them, as we witnessed in so many eyes of old and young men, women, and children, that a personal loss was felt for the death of John Strowman. We said to win such esteem and love is not only worth living, but also added to health. Keep gray, keep green the memory of the much beloved one. We offer to the bleeding hearts in the home where is John's vacant chair, and then there was a, a poem that followed that. Uh, that's his uh, tombstone, which is in St. John's Cemetery. Uh, next, we'll talk about my great-grandfather, Elmer Strominger, who married Ellen Catherine, Catherine Troop. Uh, there's a picture of Elmer, uh, Ellen, his wife, <laughs> his children, uh, here on the coffee table, from the table here. This was in the front of the house and with a uh, Packard in the 1913 Huffman uh, Elmer Ellsworth Strominger was named after the Civil War General. The, the Civil War General was the first general that died in the Civil War, and so he was named after him. Uh, he married Ellen Catherine Troop in Chicago. Uh, he was a salesman. Uh, different places, but worked for his brother-in-law in, in the music business that we'll talk about. Uh, he lived in Mechanicsburg. Um, so at the time of his father's death, David Henry Strominger, of the eight children, only two of them were still living, uh, and that was 1912. Elmer uh, bought, the, bought the farm uh, <laughs> from his surviving sister. And then his daughter, uh, Carolyn, or Carrie Marie, inherited the property since her brother um, died before Elmer did uh, because of uh, exposure to mustard gas in World War II. One. One. <laughs> I didn't catch one. Uh, so from 1912, um, when David died until 1952, the house, there was no family living in the house. Um, two generations didn't live there. Um, it was rented out. Uh, the farmers, some just farm, some lived there. It was sometimes vacant. Uh, and sometimes there were tenants living in it. Uh, as I mentioned before, the central heating system did function very well. So a lot of the people, tenants that lived in there decided to put stoves in. So there's holes in just about every room where a stovepipe went through. Uh, they also um, didn't feel like getting firewood, so they went up to the attic and ripped up the flooring in the attic <laughs> to burn. Uh, so some of the flooring's missing in my attic. Uh, then in 1952, my father decided, when he had, uh, got it from his mother, decided to use it as a sub summer residence. Um, so from 1952 to 2000, it was used just as a summer home. And then in 2001, Laura and myself and my son Lance moved into the house full time. So this again is uh, St. John <coughs> Cemetery on Heck Hill Road. Uh, this is the family we spoke about, mom and dad. This was the older daughter. Um, <laughs> this was John the teacher. Uh, his sister is on the back side of this. And then there's the four children. The only one missing is my heir, Elmer Strominger, who is buried over in Pakistan. <laughs> okay, so we made it through the first family. It'll go faster. Uh, so this is Moore, uh, John Moore. Um, <coughs> he arrived around the 1790s. He came from Philly uh, with 
both him and his father came about the same time. And his property is up on the observatory and it's called uh, Morstead. Uh, he married Sarah Pugh. Uh, they obtained the property in 1794, uh, as I mentioned, it's up on the observatory in Sinsburg Road. Uh, they didn't build the house until 1818. Um, and some information I recently got um, mentioned that the Penns granted the prior owner a patent for this land in 1753. Uh, there's a very old spring house on the property really cool when you have to go inside of it. Um, and in the literature I have, it's called Very Old, and I think it might have been that they lived there during construction of the bigger house. Um, so once John Moore passed away, it went to his son Anthony, and then it went to his grandson John Moore. Um, when the second John Moore died, it was uh, the estate auction belonged had left the family. Next page. Um, talk about the pictures first. So it has, still has a beautiful barn. This is a current picture. This is one that I got from the current owners. Uh, you got to see the barn, a very neat barn. And they have three cats that were, when we were there, that were looking out the window. <laughs> so my son took one of the pictures and I blew it up because I thought it was neat, all these cats. And, and I had like cats, I had cat socks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this house was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, and I have some information that I recently got from the current owners uh, that I'll just read rather than paraphrasing. During the Civil War, the house was a stop on the Underground Railroad. When word came that the Confederate Army was moving north into PA, it was thought then to destroy the rail yards around Harrisburg. But Moores apparently decided to seek safely somewhere else and left the farm. At some point soon after, an underground railroad agent brought a slave named Sebastian to the house. Not finding the Moors at home, he hid, he locked Sebastian in the back of the basement, thinking the Moors would soon return. When they did finally return, some days or weeks later, after the Battle of Gettysburg, they found that Sebastian had hung himself from a spike in one of the log beams. Uh, if Sebastian truly does haunt the house, he certainly never seems to do so with the intent to drive anyone out. My first experience, and this is uh, a prior owner that lived there um, in the late 1900s, uh, my first experience was hearing someone open the basement door and walk down the stairs. I was sitting in the living room and was alone at the time. I was so sure I heard it that I walked out to the kitchen and finding the door open called down the stairs. Since thinking it was strange that the light wasn't on, I had just come in from groundhog hunting with my 22 rifle. I actually reloaded it, turned on the light, and went down and looked around reminding the intruder that I was armed and dangerous. I was 12 or possibly 13 at the time. That night I mentioned at the dinner table the incident my dad said, funny, I thought I heard someone go down there a couple of weeks ago. Um, just to read a little bit more, we had a collie dog that seemed to watch something move through the living room on occasion. His ears would stand, stand straight up, he would lift his head and then turn his head as if as he followed whatever it was moving through the room. No growling or barking, just watching. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting and I did ask the current owners if they've seen Sebastian and they did mention some occurrences of lights um, suddenly being on. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And another, another short story I'll read quick. Um, the, this house uh, was pointed back in around 1959, uh, and it was done by a stonemason named Emery Baker. He was known locally as the hermit who lived in an old, rundown, completely overgrown farmhouse that was back a short lane from the bottom of the first hill 
when you head towards Lisbon. He had a long white beard and was frequently seen walking the roads with his cane. He once asked me to bring him any young groundhogs that I shot. He said they were good eating if you got them, if you got them before they got too old. Uh, he had a, cli a calliope that he would play at, at night that people could hear. And the word is that sometimes if you're near there and the air is still, you can still hear the calliope playing. <laughs> some of the other ones that we talked about. And his top hat is actually on the table here. So that is from maybe the 1880s. Uh, so Abram Troop, he was born in 1829. Uh, he came from Adams County, maybe 1850s. I don't know around there. Uh, he married a Mary Fox that was from Germany. Uh, he was a blacksmith. And this is his <coughs> blacksmith shop, and that's a picture from early 19, um, 1800, late 1800s. This is the same property, uh, anybody, you know, Paul Fisher, he currently owns this, and this is on Market Street. Uh, an interesting story is that Abram Treat uh, paid a substitute to fight, to fight for him in the Civil War. Uh, the man was captured, uh, sent to Andersonville Prison, and the man was disabled, and when he returned, uh, Abram and his wife took care of him for the rest of his life. Okay, so still on uh, Abram Troop, he had eight children. Uh, his son, John, founded J.H. Troop Music House, and this is a picture of J.H. Troop. Um, in 1881, two of his other sons, uh, Lewis and Abraham, also founded a music business, uh, Troop Brothers Music. And they both had stores on Market Square until, oh, into the 1970s, 60s, 70s, so some of you may have heard that. Um, and actually one of the buildings is, is preserved in Market Square. And, uh, you can see that it's a, a troop building. Uh, then, uh, Abram Troop's, or John J.H. Troop's grandson uh, was Bobby Troop. Uh, he was an actor, a pianist, a singer, songwriter. Uh, some of his songs were Get Your Kicks on Route 66, uh, Daddy, Baby, Baby All the Time, and The Meaning of the Blues. He also was in TV on Dragnet and Emergency, and you can see him here, and that was actually his wife, Julie London. And he was also in the movie MASH, and he had one line that he said over and over. And does anybody know what that line was? Are you? Goddamn, are we? <laughs> I didn't want to say it, so. He said that same line over and over in the movie. So that was okay, moving on. This is the last family that I'm going to talk about. Heart, and you can see another G added. So five, five. This is five G. Uh, uh, Johann came from Germany in 1748. And we'll talk about him and his son John. We've already talked about everybody else. So we move on to the next slide. So Jacob came from Franconia, Germany, uh, somewhere around 1723-24. Uh, he arrived on the ship uh, Patience and Margaret, uh, which arrived on August 25th, 1748. He was 24 years old. Uh, he married Catherine Landis, and he's buried in Lewis Ferry in the Bat's Nest, uh, the old, Lutheran, old Union and Reformed Lutheran graveyard. Um, he, 
can't read the inscriptions on these anymore, but my dad had, uh, he spent a lot of times transcribing uh, tombstones at various cemeteries, but on both of these, uh, there's this message, remember me as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. I am now, so will you be, prepared for death and follow me. Kind of like, come on down. <laughs> Girl, the cherry to cheer you say. Okay. So next, uh, his son John Hart. And look, we've got another pressure cooker. <laughs> so he was born in 1762. He married Sarah Vernon. Um, and he was actually, John was actually buried in a field behind Danny Bear's barn, people you know, uh, near the mill, near Silver Lake Inn. And the tombstone was moved across the road to the Bat's Nest Cemetery, and he was put next to his parents in 1979. They were, they were glad to see him. <laughs> I won't say who did that stealing of the stone, but that's his actual stone that was taken from the other cemetery. And the concrete is another, there's a lot of history in it. Not just about John Hart, but the sons and all kinds of stuff on there. And stuff. Okay. And I have some acknowledgments. First, to my awesome, awesome friend Art over there, who was <laughs> helping me put all my stuff together into a PowerPoint presentation helping me with the PowerPoint tool that I didn't realize I was as weak in it so he kind of showed me how lousy I was in it, but also really helping me organize how I wanted to put the mass of this stuff together. Uh, secondly, my father, who spent hours and hours <coughs> in libraries and cemeteries, handwriting, copying, um, he corresponded with all kinds of people and different agencies compiling a mass of, of, geneolo of genealogy files and uh, which he consolidated into this big book and there's actually nine copies of this book. He hand wrote, this is all handwritten, he transcribed nine of these, one each of his kids. He made one for the, his first three grandchildren he was working on one for his last children before he was unable to finish them. And he also, there's also one of these is in the Pennsylvania State Library. Uh, so again, there's the uh, cherry poem uh, that I'll leave you with. And that's it. How did I do time once? Did I make it? Close enough. Close enough? Well, we walk out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That being a, a non-lineal descendant, I don't have 
have a lot of information on that when I can't do other things. So I can't, can't tell you. Yes, very how, how did these people earn a living? Uh, I don't have a lot of most of them. Uh, I know the Strominger's were primarily farmers, um, and, uh, other than the one that we, I read about that was a teacher. Um, and then Abram Troop was a blacksmith. But other than that, I don't have a lot of, don't have the occupations. Yes? Uh, John Hart's burial in the field behind Danny Bear's barn. Have you been up there to see it? Well, it was, it was actually my dad that actually moved the stone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, there was only four stones left. And in his, in his notes, it was kind of funny. There's four stones with horses walking on them. So he moved. He moved. Um, I was wondering who all was buried up there. Yeah, I don't. I, probably nobody else of uh, my relations. And he might have stole that stone too. I <laughs> kind of made a pressure cooker for him. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know who else did up there. And that was. Uh, and that was 1979 that he actually moved that stone. So we got 40 years, who knows uh, what's left up there. And somebody had asked a question about it just a few years ago, uh, not knowing who was up there, but just uh, talking about the condition of the burial plots. Were they asking about that, or were they talking about the bat's nest? No, they were talking about the one up on Danny Bears. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, I've never actually been to that. It was just, uh, just my father's place. I wonder if Danny would know that. I mean, he's been there, and, and his his parents. I wonder if he would know. I don't know. I I've, I've never met them, but I think his mother was a relative of my mother's. His mother, Anita. Oh, was that his mother's name? No, no, that wouldn't have been. Well, she probably was, but. Uh, uh, goes back further the generations because mm -hmm. uh, there's a it was a Brenneman uh, well Anita was a Rocky <laughs> well I wondered if Rockies were buried up there oh is that so, what you're wondering yeah well only because I, I, I seen that there were Rockies in the family and I thought oh <laughs> well there might be three more stones up there somewhere yeah. there's only four of them <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Um, and I just wanted to formally introduce myself. I'm Dominish Miller. Um, I run the Preserving the History of Newburytown, but I just took over the Lewisbury History Group from Glenn. Um, so I'll be in charge of scheduling these presentations. We're going to try and do every other month. Um, so if you haven't signed up for our email list yet, I have a notebook and a pen over here. You can put your name and your email. And if you're on social media, you can follow Preserving the History of Newburytown. And we also have a website. Um, I videotaped this presentation, so it'll be on Facebook and on YouTube. So I can post the link on the website.